All right, so today we're gonna look at rates of weathering. We're gonna be breaking it down, popping and locking, or, well, breaking it down. Well, before we get into what we're going to do today, I have a little experiment today. Really easy, simple experiment. I've got two cups, and I've filled each one with the same amount of ice. I put, well, roughly. There probably is a little bit more in this one, but not a whole lot more. And what I've done is on this one, I've taken the time and it's been crushed, and this one, I just used full ice cubes. And at the end of the video, which one do you think is going to melt the most? Which one will drop down? And in fact, to measure this, I have an erasable pin here so my wife doesn't kill me. And I'm going to make a line on the outside, kind of can see that, that shows you where the ice is. And this one's a little bit harder, but... Right, the ice is pretty close up here to the top. So at the end of the video, we're going to check and we're going to see which one has melted more. And we're going to see how that comes back to weathering. You might already be able to think of it. So go ahead and write down what do you think your hypothesis is? Crushed or whole ice cubes? Well, today we're going to be looking to, at three things. We're going to see how the type of material affects how fast or slow it might weather or break down break it down. We're also going to look how surface area, the amount of space, is going to change how weathering occurs. We're also going to look at how weathering changes by different places on the earth and how that all comes together. So let's get going. We've kind of already covered this quite a bit and by this time you should be um, right away be able to memorize this. What is weathering? And we said weathering is the process of breaking down rocks into smaller pieces. And we've titled those smaller pieces sediment. We said it could be boulders all the way down to clay or silts. We looked at the two different types. We said physical weathering, where the rock stays the same type of rock. It just gets smaller. Could be through water or gravity or smashing it. Or could be chemical weathering, where the stuff inside it, the molecules, are actually going to change. So it could be through acids, dissolving, oxidation. So here we are. If we're breaking down rock, if all over our planet water and ice and acids are wearing down our rock and creating sediment, why is our planet just not covered with just little bits of sediment? I mean, weathering happens much faster than you'd think than plate tectonics. I mean, plate tectonics, you don't see volcanoes erupting here in Sandy, but we still have really tall mountains. Mount Hood is huge. So what causes weathering to slow down or speed up or, or even stop in some cases? So that's what we're looking at today. And we're going to see there's probably three reasons. If you looked here a second ago, you might have saw what we're doing. What, what causes this to slow down? And the first one really is what the rock is made of. Some rocks weather really, really fast. Limestones, sandstones, these are rocks that are really loosely held together. In fact, limestone is just fossilized shells. It's calcium carbonate. Uh, in class, we could put acid on it and it would melt away. It's also what you see in Florida. Florida's rock there is a lot of limestones and it erodes really quickly. Well, on the other hand, volcanic rocks like basalts and granites, they're much stronger and they take a lot longer to wear away. So keeping that in mind, would you see more erosion in Oregon where we have lots of basalts and granites and rhyolites and andesites? Or would you expect more weathering in Florida where the rock is mostly limestone and sedimentary? Well, because of this, we would see there's more weathering in Florida because the rock is softer. It's harder here in Oregon because weathering depends on what the rock's made of. It also matters how big it is. Now, this is a little bit not what you think. Larger rocks weather slower than littler rocks. I would think the other way, right? If it's a giant rock, it's got lots of area where it can weather away, but it doesn't work that way. What happens, it's all about this idea called surface area to volume. Now, I know you guys have studied somewhat of area, and you've already done volume, and really surface area is just taking all the area of a three-dimensional shape and adding them together. So if you had a cube, you'd go height times the width, and then you would add each side together. Now, I'll multiply them. You would add them together. So if you had a one by one, one centimeter by one centimeter cube, you would add one centimeter one centimeter, one centimeter, one centimeter, one centimeter, once to have six centimeters, right? So what we see is rocks with a very high surface area and low volume weather really quick. 
something. There's more space around them to weather for that weathering to get into. Whereas giant rocks, you've got to think all the stuff is inside of it, it's harder to get into that. In fact, we're going to see at the end, maybe that has something to do with our experiment. If you think about that, we might see here. So, it depends on how big it is. The bigger the rock, the slower the weathering. Right? So, sand weathers away even smaller very quickly, whereas a boulder takes a little bit longer. Our third and final one is where the rock is. Some places have more weathering because their climate and their weather creates more weathering. So for instance, if you are in a place that's really wet, you'd expect to have a lot more weathering from water. Whereas a place that's really warm, you get more chemical weathering because chemicals like to react in warm temperatures. It helps them get the energy to, to actually create that reaction. Whereas places that are cold, like maybe here in Oregon or up on Mount Hood, you'd get physical weathering because ice would be cracking and breaking open. But on the other hand, you'd also need a place where the ice could melt. So really, really, really cold places like Antarctica don't have as much weathering as you might see in Sandy because there's not time for the melting and coming back together. So where a place is and the climate really helps determine weathering. How much water is there, how much temperature is. Um, it also is where the rock is in elevation. Now this kind of maybe seem a little bit different, but how high the rock is in the air. If a rock is really high, let's say on the top of a mountain, there's more weather because it's harder to get the precipitation up above, above it. So it comes out and rains. We'll get to that when we get to weather, but you'll see that the higher you go, the more weather you get up there. So at the top of a mountain, more water's falling, it's colder, more freeze thaw, and you get more weathering. Whereas down at the bottom of the valley, you may not get as much weathering because there's not as much rain. Um, we also see something called deposition. It's coming in our next couple of videos that's happening there. So you're seeing there's, depending upon where you are, high, low, um, wet, dry climates, you're going to see different types of weathering. All these three things of whether or not the type of rock it is, the surface area to volume, and also where it is on the land are going to help determine how fast the weathering occurs. You're going to see it's going to kind of balance each other, right? Um, well, here, let's just go on. Let's give it a great example. This is the Himalayas. Right? I have a college professor who like to call it the Himalayas, but we'll say the Himalayas. Now, the Himalayas are a convergent boundary. We've got China over here. We've got India, and they're smashing together, and they're creating these giant mountain ranges that we call the Himalayas, that giant scar. Rock is literally being thrust up into the air, and we have a lot of metamorphic rock there because they're being squeezed and heated together. Well, as they come together, there's India, we'll get up our slide there, and China, right? As they come together, the Himalayas are being forced up. The higher they go, we just talked about that the more weather they receive, and it creates weathering to come down. So we see we got plate tectonics pushing up, we got weathering pushing down. Hmm, it's kind of at odds with each other. Well, they're going to strike a balance, and eventually weathering is going to win because plate tectonics can't go on forever, but weathering can forever. So let's look at the faster. So let's say we have a lot of pushing. We push together the Himalayas. The Himalayas shoot up into the air. They're going to go really high. Well, the higher they go, the more weathering they get. So they're going to start to get more freeze thaw. They're going to get more rain. The temperature is going to make them shrink further. So they're going to shrink down. So it's balancing. As plate tectonics is pushing up really hard, weathering is pushing down even harder. See that? It's balancing. Or let's say, for instance, plate tectonics starts to go away that weathering starts to shrink too. Now it's always going to be bigger than plate tectonics, but not totally. So it's going to slowly weather them away. So it's really easy for tall mountains to get weathered quickly, but then they slowly kind of fizzle out. A great example is our Appalachian Mountains. The Appalachian Mountains started out as the Himalayas, these huge giant mountains, when Africa smashed into North America, right? And they started, they grew up, they got really tall, weathering and the rain brought them down to the ground, and now we have these nice rounded hills, and they'll slowly, slowly go away. 
So we could see here, we've had three things we looked at. We talked about how weathering the material, right? Hard volcanic rock makes weathering slower, whereas sedimentary rock makes it go much faster, like limestone and sandstone. We see that surface area. The more surface area you have, the faster the weathering is going to occur. Uh, well, I should say surface area to volume. The faster it's going to occur. And last is where it is on the earth. If there's a place where it's wetter, it's going to have more erosion than if it's drier. If it's warmer, you're going to see more erosion from chemical weathering, uh, more chemical weathering in a warm spot. And you're going to find freeze thaw in a temperate spot like here in Sandy. So let's look at our experiment. We're almost finished here. See if we can find my mark. Well, my mark erased here, but you're just going to have to take my word for it. Let's look at them again. I think it's really easy to see this one has weathered a lot more. It's melted. And it's that same idea of surface area to volume, that each one of these chips has air around it that's going to allow for that ice to melt, whereas these doesn't have as much air around it because they're big. They're giant. All right, so in class, what we're going to look at is we're going to use math. Oh, I can hear the groan through the computer. We're going to use math to find out and review how surface area is going to work, and we're going to come back to that. In our next video, we're going to see the, math, the total effect of weathering, and it's going to create something. Uh, and it's going to create something really, 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 really important. Soil. And we're going to see there. So, remember, as you go through, just keep moving forward.